We will be looking this morning to Revelation chapter 6, 9 through 16, and some other passages in the Revelation. I first titled this this morning or yesterday or sometime this week, <laughs> The Good News of the Holy Wrath of God. I don't know that we normally think that way, do we? But I would suggest to us that the wrath of God is good news. And maybe from the verses and the things that we'll see today that, uh, that will uh, become obvious to us. So let's pray as we get started. Father, we bless you and praise you that you are the one, the true, and the living God. You do all things well. We thank you for hearing the heart cries of those who suffer, those who are in agony, those who have all manner of difficulties in a fallen world, especially of your children. We know that you are a good shepherd who cares. We thank you that there is coming a settling up day, that all the things that seem to slide by in our world and people get away with so many things that there is an accounting day. And we thank you for what you reveal of yourself in your mercies and in your wrath. And for this we pray and give thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. One of the good definitions of the wrath of God is that it is the settled opposition of God against that which is wrong, that which is evil. He's consistent. It's not off the handle, is not uh, out of control, but the settled, consistent uh, hatred of sin by Almighty God. Now, in the sixth seal, there are some amazing uh, words that are used to describe events that will be happening in the heavenlies, but the most important thing for our purposes this morning is in verse 15 and 16 where the, there is the announcement of not merely the wrath of God, but the wrath of the Lamb. Now that sounds unusual, doesn't it? But I want us to have, make sure we have a context. And so we can't do this too often and when we pick up somewhere in the Revelation, we have to remind ourselves that the people who first got this would have had family members, friends uh, who'd been martyred for Christ or who, like John, was maybe on the Isle of Patmos or somewhere like that, uh, banished, doing slave labor. But at the right moment, God invaded that island. I think it would do us good just to try to meditate on that for a moment and think of what an, what an incredible moment that would have been in the Apostle John's life. And I would suggest that in your life and mine, at times when we feel the lowest, if we continue by the grace of God to walk with him, we will find God breaking in on our lives with comfort, with revelation, uh, with a friend or some way. So, the point is that God has a habit of being present and invading the lives of his people. He has a history of coming to the rescue of his redeemed. Now, he doesn't always do it the same way. But I would submit to you that God came to the rescue of the first martyr, Stephen. It was just all over Stephen that he was conscious of God. And he may have come to the rescue of you by delivering you from something. For someone else, he has delivered you through something. But I cannot find anybody in the Revelation, and we have accounts of those who uh, had all kinds of experiences in life, but for eternity, I cannot find a one who has any regrets. Well, what I had to pay was too costly down on earth, and so I don't think... I think heaven is uh, uh, kind of overpriced or overstated. Uh, what's the big deal? 
No. You're kidding yourself? Uh, people are thoroughly happy and rejoicing and worshiping the Lamb. No one has any regrets in heaven. And no matter how, wh at what point you may be in your struggle right now with something, uh, God will see you through it, and one day uh, you'll rejoice for all eternity. But somehow, when this book was completed, God got it to the churches, probably to the church at Ephesus, first of all. Now, again, I think is, even as it was a stunning experience that the Apostle John had to have had, and we don't know how long it took. Uh, maybe it was a deal like uh, uh, when the Messiah was put together, the music for the Messiah was put together by Handel. Uh, it, it took place almost in 24 hours, just an incredible quick uh, revelation. Could have been over a period of weeks, months, I don't know. But there came a day when someone walked into an assembly of believers, and he's carrying a scroll. And I suspect the first thing out of his mouth was, I have in my hand a scroll on which is written a book that God has given our beloved apostle John. He had everybody's attention. And they began to read that book. It was a book that was written to servants of Jesus Christ, love slaves of Jesus Christ. And it is a book that is entitled The Unveiling of Jesus Christ. And what this is all about then is, well, as the title says, it is the unveiling, the glorious unveiling of Jesus Christ, the sovereign Lamb of God. They needed to see him. The word of God, the revelation, is an unveiling of him. The Holy Spirit is present to make it real in your life and mine. Now, rooted in the foundation uh, in, in the foundation of, of all that is going to be revealed in the Revelation is, of course, all the things that Jesus accomplished at his first coming. So now we have an unveiling of, from the resurrected, ascended Christ as he is today. And it unveils all that Jesus is doing today. It unveils all that he will be doing today. And so something else that I think we think too little of is that the Revelation, indeed the whole Bible, but especially the Revelation, unveils to us God's ultimate purpose. If you thought about that phrase for a minute, what would you come up with? It's revealed clearly in the Revelation. So here is a, a neat outline of the book. Revelation chapters 1 through 19. The sovereign Lamb of God in heaven, he is in heaven, and from heaven he is ruling, he is saving, he is working through his church, he is redeemed, uh, shepherding, guiding, all those who are blood-bought, regardless of what time frame they may live in, no matter how you may slice in time events, uh, Jesus Christ is working through his redeemed. He is saving those who are his elect. He is watching over them. He is guiding them. He is uh, taking good care of, of his property. And then you can take those same chapters. We'll start with chapter 4, verse, uh, chapter 4 through 19. And simultaneously, the sovereign Lamb of God in heaven and from heaven is ruling and reigning over all the peoples of the earth. We seem to feel like, because of the way things appear to be from our headlines and what we see and hear, that uh, Jesus is somewhere taking a vacation. He's not. He's ruling. He's reigning. He's uh, kings and kingdoms and presidents and dictators and events of this present hour. Uh, in the midst of all of these, the redeemed uh, experience the wrath of men and the wrath of Satan, never the wrath of God, and the people of the world experience God's overruling hand. He is carrying out his purposes. And we'll see a verse a little bit later in Romans that in two verses puts this all together. But 
again, the servants of the Lord, the love slaves of the Lord, have never experienced and will never experience the wrath of God. So you have all of these things happening simultaneously. Uh, you can probably have more dishes than you can twirl. God can't. Uh, it's no big deal for God to simultaneously be working through all of the details of nations around the world and also working through his redeemed. And so the last chapters show us also what is the ultimate goal of all of history. Uh, don't you think it would be important for us to understand what his goal is for you as a believer what his goal is for us as a church, what his goal is for all of his redeemed. Well, let's look in chapter 21, verse 9 through 14. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls filled with the last seven plagues came to me and talked with me saying, Come and I will show you the bride, the lamb's wife. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain, and he showed me the great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. Her light was like a most precious stone, like jasper stone, crystal, a clear as crystal. And she had high and great walls with 12 gates and 12 angels at the gates and the names written on them, which are the names of the 12 tribes of the children of Israel. Three gates on the east, three on the north, three on the south, and three on the west. Now, the wall of the city had 12 foundations, and on them were the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. So he's using this to describe the bride. And so it's easy to see from this uh, that there is just one bride. Jesus doesn't have more than one bride. He has one bride. And in the time period in which we live, there may be divisions here and divisions there. Ephesians 2 talks about how the gospel brings all that twain into one. But at the end of the day, in the last chapter of the Bible, uh, there's one bride, one city, comprised of all the redeemed. Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. This is the ultimate purpose of history. Everything else will be history. <laughs> Uh, all the great things that people accomplish and think so highly of will be history. God is saving a numberless multitude. He's been doing this from the, from the get-go. Again, the ultimate goal of all history is the bride of Christ, those redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. What will they do for all history? What will you be doing for all of history? You will be serving Him. You will be seeing His face. You will be reigning with him for all eternity. His name will be on your forehead. Now in chapter 22, verse 3 through 5, And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. The book was addressed to his servants. Now he lets his servants know when it gets to the end of the way for all eternity, you're going to be serving the Lamb. And as we've said earlier, uh, they shall see his face, and his name shall be on their foreheads. There shall be no night there. There will be no need of lamp or light of the sun, for the Lord God gives the light, and they shall reign with him forever. So this is the way it's going to be for eternity. This is your future, child of God. No regrets. For all eternity, in the presence of Jesus, seeing him face to face, ruling and reigning with him. And there's only one option to this. In chapter 21, verse 8, But the fearful, or the cowardly, the unbelieving, the abominable, the murderers, the sexual immoral, the sorcerers, the idolaters, and all the liars shall have their part in the lake of fire, or in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. This is the ultimate reality of the wrath of God. We are, I mean, there have been many expressions of the wrath of God all throughout time. Uh, I think uh, when you say 
Noah had something to say, hey, I know something about that. He didn't experience it, but he was affected by it and was kept through it. But the people of his generation experienced the holy wrath of God. But no matter what you go or where you go, the ultimate expression of the wrath of God took place once, never be repeated, never be topped. Calvary, where Jesus paid the sin debt for a numberless multitude of those, of those elect from every nation. What an amazing reality we have. How, how could we be bored with Christianity? How, how could we be a nonchalant about Jesus? How, how could we just uh, yawn at Jesus? When he paid a debt he did not owe because we owed a debt we could not pay. So right now the world is smug and arrogant and has no fear of God. Has no fear of the wrath of God. And so they pour out that venom on Christians. And Christians suffer. And here in the fifth um, uh, seal, the Christians are crying, How long, O oh Lord? When is there going to be justice? And they said, Well, there, there's, there's yet more who are going to suffer as you did. But there's coming a day. And he, reads, he states, it, states it there in at Revelation 6, 15 and 16. And the kings of the earth, and the great men of the earth, and the rich men, and the commanders, the mighty men, and every slave, and every free man hid themselves in the caves, and in the rocks of the mountains, and said to the mountains and the rocks, Fall on us, hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb. It's too late to be praying that prayer. And if you die without Christ, it'll be too late for you. And I had the privilege of speaking at a memorial service yesterday, and it was a, a, a room packed with mostly people, I'd say, in their 20s and 30s, maybe 40s. I'd never met before. I know nothing about them. But I know that they're going to spend eternity somewhere. And I know that in our culture today, there are very few people in that age group who have any consciousness of the Bible. They don't read the Bible. They don't even know who Jesus is, a lot of them. And so I started with, I don't know what you know about Jesus, but uh, we have to deal with this. He's either a liar or a lunatic or his Lord. Now, that's not original with me. Some of you have heard that before, but that's reality. Uh, who Jesus is, is not up for debate. He has revealed who he is. The wrath of God is not up for discussion. It's set in stone. God is a God of wrath. Well, my God is not a God of wrath. Your God is an idol. The God of the Bible is love. Yes, he's love. But he is holy, and he is righteous, and he is just, and he will mete out justice. Now, for the Christian, we should be astounded with gratitude that by the grace and mercy of God, our justice has been met at Calvary. But if you're here without Christ, you should know that God is not under any obligation to keep you alive one moment longer. Repent. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. All who come to him he will in no wise cast out. Now let's again try to put the wrath of God in, in the perspective of what we find in Romans chapter 9, verse 16 through 24. And we see it contrasted with mercy. In the Revelation, there is an incredible contrast between those who are the recipients of God's mercy and those who are the recipients of God's wrath. In Romans 9, 16 through 24, So then it is not of him who wills, nor of him who runs, but of God who shows mercy. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, 
For this very purpose I have raised you up, that I may show my power in you, and that my name may be declared in all the earth. Now, there, there are a lot of people who are very uncomfortable with Romans chapter 9, and they like to push it as, oh, that's just to the Jews. Well, God is consistent in his character. He doesn't have one uh, system of morality and, and righteousness for one group of people and something totally different for another. This is the truth of God, regardless of where you are. And this is how God dealt with Pharaoh, who's not a Jew, not a believer. And the Bible says that for this purpose, I have raised you up. You say, I can't imagine God being like that. Well, you're not God. And we dare not accuse God of injustice. But that's the question that will come, and so that's what Romans 9 will tell us. He goes on to say, he makes the application far, much further than, than Pharaoh. He says in verse 18, Therefore he has mercy on whom he wills, and whom he wills he hardens. The God of the universe has revealed this in his word. This is not up for debate. This is what he says. You will say to me, why does he still find fault? For who has resisted his will? But indeed, O oh man, who are you to reply against God? Now again, this is not the Apostle Paul being a smart aleck. This is the Apostle Paul under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit writing what God tells him to write. This is God's word. It's not Paul's word. He has mercy on whom he wills, whom he wills he hardens. Verse 19, you say to me then, why does he still find fault for who has resisted his will? But indeed, O oh man, who are you to reply against God? Will the thing formed say to him who formed it, why have you made me like this? Does not the potter have power over the clay from the same lump to make one vessel of honor and another for dishonor. You ever been to a house or a place where they make pottery? A little place in northeast Georgia we love because I drink coffee in one of their cups every morning. <laughs> and you can go and sit on the back porch in a swing and you look down below and there's a stream and fish and they got the little thing you put quarters in and you get a handful of some sort of stuff, and you throw it down, and all the fish come after it. I can't imagine being in that little pottery place and me telling the potter what to do with his clay. Verse 22. Here is an incredible... Verse 22 and verse 23 and verse 24, are just stunningly incredible. What if God, wanting to show his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath prepared for destruction, and that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy which he had prepared beforehand for glory, even us whom he called, not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles. Did you see the radical distinction in those two verses? All the vessels are made from the same lump. Some of the vessels he endures with much long suffering, they are vessels of wrath, and they are prepared for destruction. It did not say he prepared them for destruction. The lost person 
uh, people talk about double predestination. That is not true. God does not have to do a single thing for the lost person is already under the wrath of God. God doesn't have to predestine them to anything. They are, we're already under the wrath of God. If you're outside of Christ, you're under the wrath of God. The word predestination is only used in the Bible to speak of those who are his children. And so God does not look down. Now, you say, well, didn't he harden Pharaoh's heart? Yes. And Pharaoh hardened his own heart. But God's hardening Pharaoh's heart did not put fresh evil into him to make him do something he did not want to do. He encouraged him in the path of his own desires. But the point here, apart from Pharaoh, here's a pot, here's some clay, or a potter and some clay, and what is God doing? What is God doing in the earth? God is displaying his attributes in the things that he does on vessels of mercy and in the things that he allows and brings on the vessels of wrath. What if God, wanting to show his wrath and make his power known, endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath prepared for destruction? Now here's the great news. And that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy which he had prepared beforehand for glory, even us whom he called, not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles. All of human history is a grand display of God. That's why the whole Bible is a grand revelation of God. Remember the resurrected Christ said, oh, the Old Testament it spoke of me. All of it spoke of me. And here, uniquely in the last book of the Bible, this is the unveiling of me as I am now and what I'm doing now. So a grand display of the mercy of God revealed through Jesus Christ, the Lamb, upon, mercy, upon vessels of mercy whom he has prepared. You and I should be astounded why should God do that for me? I didn't deserve that. That's something he did. The, the person who should never be without, is the person who is never without cause for gratitude. The person who is never without cause for thanksgiving is the Christian who's been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, by the mercies of God. Didn't earn it, can't earn it, can't lose it. A grand display of the suffering, the long suffering of God, the patience of God, is upon the vessels of wrath. And they will experience the wrath of God for eternity. Question. Is this kind of news what you're receiving when you watch the news, when you read the news, when you get on your iPad or your iPhone? Many of us fill our minds trying to hear something about the news because we think we need to know something. I understand that. I've done my share of that. But have you been in the Word of God to learn the real news? Are you and I astounded because we know that what's going on in this world, we can't put all the pieces together. God's God. We're not. But he has given us incredible revelation in the Bible. Child of God, you are a vessel of mercy. As Ephesians 2 points out, we were children of wrath, even as others. We were made from the same clump of clay. We can't give ourselves a, a star. If we're not flooded with God's perspective, you know what we'll do? We'll chase the wind. And there are people in churches from the pulpit to the back pew, and their whole life is chasing the wind. You ever caught the wind? Winds change. 
You never catch it. And so in churches all over the land, there's always something new that we're looking for. Because we're not focused in on that which is real and that which does not change. The character of God. The whole Bible is an unveiling of the attributes and the character of God, not the least of which are his mercy and his wrath. This is good news. The Revelation, chapters 1 through 19, the sovereign Lamb of God is presently in heaven and from heaven. He is working through shepherding, guiding his blood-bought servants, the redeemed. Chapters 4 through 19, good news. The sovereign Lamb is in heaven and from heaven, is ruling and overruling the kings and the peoples of the earth and the events of the earth the kings and the presidents, the dictators, and all the rest. The supreme good news is that when it's all said and done at the end of history, there's a bride. And those redeemed by the blood of the Lamb from all eras of time, for all eternity, will serve him, see his face, reign with him for all eternity, and their names written on his forehead. We need to allow this truth to so saturate us that it affects how we do our work. It affects how we treat family. It affects how we treat the church and minister and work in the church. It affects our attitude toward the lost. And so this is context for the fifth and sixth seal. The fifth seal martyred Christians wondering how long is there not going to be justice? The sixth seal is the answer and unfolding with more t to come later. God's answer to the cries. And so in verse 15 and 16, we have the beginning of this uh, and I would, uh, e even though there are Romans 1, there is a, a present tense unveiling of the wrath of God today in many ways. But this is talking about wrath that is yet coming at the end of days. And it's for the Apostle Paul, I mean the Apostle John, when he got this, maybe when he got through writing it, maybe as he was meditating upon what he had just been given and written down, at some point, he realized, I'm still in exile at Patmos. And he lived there for the rest of his life, how long, however long that was. God, for all that incredible revelation, did not lift him up and restore him to the church at Ephesus. I'm sure the next day when he had to go and work in the rock mines or whatever it was they had him doing, I'm sure it was still hard. I'm sure that the, 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 his captors were still merciless toward him. But I'm also sure of this. He was never the same. Because he had not only written and folded up, rolled up something and sent it off, it was now in his heart and soul and it radically affected him because he knew that in God's perfect time, he had, a, he had an eternity waiting for him. Where he would see the face of Jesus, rule and reign with him, serve him, and the Lord's name on his forehead. Hallelujah, what a Savior. This is why. There are so many stories throughout history of Christians in their greatest hours of persecution manifested such joy and singing. They had experiences much like Stephen. I don't know what's coming down the pike for our world. A lot of bad stuff is already here, and a lot of bad stuff is already taking place in other parts of the world. It's been upgraded from where it has been 20 or 30 years ago. 
or downgraded, if you want to put it that way. I can't think of a more important time for us to get serious about the core essential truth of this book about the unveiling of Jesus, about the unveiling of mercy, about the unveiling of wrath. And you know, I think that the Acts Christians in Acts 4, who, so far as I understand in the timing of things, uh, they were functioning at a time before John had been given the revelation. But they had revelation of the ways of God. And so they're persecuted. And so what happens? I don't know what's going to be dumped on your plate and my plate in the next years. But what's important is not that. What's important is how we respond. And so in Acts 4, being let go from their persecutors, they went to their own companions. You need to have close communion with a body of believers. You need some companions in Christ. You need some companions. We need to be the sort of companions where we can hold up each other. We can be like Aaron and her on either side of Moses. We grow weak. We need each other. So they returned to their own company and reported all that the chief priests and the elders had said to them. So when they heard that, they whined. They went and filed a letter of complaint to the officials. When they heard that, they raised their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, you are God. You made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them. By your mouth, your servant David said, it's almost like, this, Lord, look at this. You wrote this. You had David to write this. Why do the nations rage and the people imagine vain things and plot vain things? The king of the earth took their stand, and the rulers were gathered against them, against the Lord and against his Christ. For truly against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate with the Gentiles and the people of Israel were gathered together. When people start hating Jesus, they forget that they hated each other. And when people hate you for being a Christian or are against you for being a Christian, you'll find some strange bedfellows joining hands. Not because they hate you, but because they hate Jesus. And so, what were they gathered for? Verse 28, to do whatever your hand and your promise uh, your purpose determined before to be done. That's the word of God. There are no stray molecules out there. God is not having to play cleanup. If it happened, God permitted it, God ordained it, God is in control. If they were only doing what was God's determined purpose to Jesus. Frankly, it's great comfort to know that that's, that's the way he deals with us too. Nothing gets on your plate, but it has God's check mark. Now, Lord, but here, here's where it really gets good. They didn't say, now, Lord, get us out of here. Stop it! Strike them down! All kinds of people out there 
telling the devil what to do, commanding lost people what to do. These Christians didn't do that, didn't do any of that. Now, Lord, look at their threats and grant to your servants that with all boldness they may speak the word. We have a mission. We have a calling. We have a purpose for being here. We're not to get sidetracked by all this stuff. There's a sovereign God who is in control of both the redeemed and the unredeemed, those who are vessels of mercy and those who are vessels of his wrath. And in the midst of all of that, he has ordained that we have a calling and a purpose to go make Mark and mature disciples. Give us boldness that they may speak your word by stretching out your hand to heal and that signs and wonders may be done through, your, through the name of your holy child Jesus. And when they had prayed... The place where they were assembled together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they spoke the word of God with boldness. There are times when God brings about physical healing, but there's not a day in your life when a greater miracle than that needs to be manifested in and through your life and mine the healing of your soul and your heart, Christian, of any even scent of bitterness and hate and lust and all the works of the flesh, and that you and I might be manifesting all the fruit of the Spirit, and that by the love of Christ we would just be overflowing with that, because it's by this that all people will see that we're his disciples. That's miracle stuff. It's far greater than a Someone came down the aisle and we prayed for them and, and uh, their physical heart was healed, their cancer was healed. Uh, they came down the aisle and, or they sat in their pew and they fell over dead and we prayed over them and they came back to life. That'd make the news, wouldn't it? It'll pass. But you know what never passes? When you are a channel of the gospel living the gospel, manifesting the fruit of the Spirit, and telling the gospel with boldness. This is why we're here. And with great grace and power, the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, and great grace was upon them all. This is an exciting time to be a Christian. We're vessels of mercy. We have a calling, a purpose, and we are headed for our destiny. The ultimate destiny of everything that is on the earth, nothing will be left but the bride. To see him, to rule with him, to reign with him, to be marked with him, for all eternity. But right now, we're in a world where amongst those who are lost, who at this present moment are in that horrific category of being vessels of wrath, they're already under the wrath of God, but have not experienced it in its fullness. And God has a habit of living the gospel before those who are dead in their sin and giving the words of the gospel to such ones and raising them from the dead. The gospel. Let us not be ashamed of the gospel. Oh, dear Father, we thank you that you've given us this great unveiling of yourself all through the Bible, but especially the last book. And you've given us a great unveiling of whose we are and what we're to be about, and that in Christ we're invinci invincible till you call us home. And we have something very important to be about. 
as we go to work, as we take care of families, as we pay the bills and all the rest. But that's not our purpose. Fill us, flood us with the heart prayer of those Christians in Acts 4. Resting in your great sovereignty, crying out for boldness to be useful servants of yours in this generation. And this we pray and plead in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together and sing and obey the Lord as we sing.